Expert, and welcome to this week's episode of Service Choice Unit. The goal of these shows is to bring you information on the various departments, facilities, and services that are offered by the Town of Georgina. Today we'll be talking about one of the most important services, not that all the services are important, but certainly one that, that uh, truly is important here in the town, but one that quite frankly you don't want to have to call, and I'm talking about the fire services. And I'm joined today with Chief Ron Jenkins and Fire Prevention Officer Keith Wells. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. We're going to talk first a little bit about just a general overview of, of uh, Georgina Fire Department. We have a, a large uh, geographic area and uh, some challenges with that. So give us a, an overview. Yes, well, thank you, Mayor. It's a, certainly, as I stated, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here to inform the public what we do as a fire service and exactly what the fire service consists of. So I guess to start off with, we're a composite fire service. And what does that mean? A composite fire service is one that has career staff as well as volunteers. So we still rely very much on our on our volunteers. We very much rely on our volunteer staff. That gives us the depth of response so that we can effectively fight a fire when and, and, and if they do occur. And the thing with the volunteer firemen and the, and the uh, full-time firemen, they do, you know, the, the, the training is required for, for both. The, the training is required. Uh, the province recently changed their training standards to NFPA. And we'll probably talk about this a little more as we go on, but that's really increased the the training requirements for our staff. We are a very well-trained department, but to stay uh, with the constantly changing environments, uh, training is a must and it's an ongoing effort. So now we, we are a large community, as I said, so we have the, the, three, the three fire halls. Maybe tell us a bit about who's at what halls. So uh, Georgina, as I'm sure the viewers are aware, consists of approximately 287 square kilometers. Uh, that's protected by the fire service by three halls, one in, in Keswick, one in Sutton, and one in Perfilaw. So it's a very large, very large geographic base. Uh, it is quite taxing for our service when we have a fire in either one of the east or western departments or areas because the trucks have to respond geographically all across the town. Now, if there's a f large fire in uh, in Keswick, and you draw the fire trucks from Sutton, what happens to Sutton? If, there, if there's a large fire in, in Keswick, uh, we draw the resources from all three of our stations. Uh, Excuse we'll, me. we'll either have them attend the fire to help suppress that fire or the emergency, whatever that case may be, or they will backfill uh, the surrounding stations to provide coverage. Uh, should we need all the resources at a fire, whether it be in Sutton, Perfilaw, or Keswick, uh, we do rely on mutual aid uh, with York Region, right. and we'll bring in East Gwillimbury, we'll bring in Brock from Durham uh, to ensure that we have adequate coverage. So how many full-time officers do we have right now? So we have 44 full-time firefighters. So uh, does that mean there's 44 working every single day? No, night? no, it does not. That's uh, kind of a, a bit of a, a misconception. So we have 44 full-time staff, 40 uh, suppression individuals, and three fire prevention. And that includes uh, fire prevention officer yep. Keith Wells and one training officer, as well as we have two administrative assistants who uh, keep us organized and on track. Uh, one is a part-time position and one is full-time, as well as we have a deputy chief. So are all the halls staffed every day? Uh, no, we have one strictly volunteer hall, that's in Perfilaw. Uh, so uh, back to the 40 firefighters, we are a 24-7, seven, seven days a week service. service. Exactly. So those 40 firefighters are split amongst four shifts between two halls. Uh, we do have to give our staff vacation and, and new time, obviously. And there's sick time, there's, there's sick uh, time. training. Uh, we work, as I said, 24-7, so Christmas Day there'll be staff on duty. Uh, so they'll get a day off in lieu of that day. So uh, on any given day, we'll, we hope to have eight firefighters on duty between the two stations, but uh, that will fall due to sickness, sometimes down to three and three to six. So when it comes to uh, commercial, do we do commercial inspections? Do we, do we go door to door, or how do we do that? We, we do, and I'll maybe ask Keith to, to come in on this. Certainly, right. of course. Uh, basically, our inspection program is, is really based on a, a complaint and request uh, inspection. We do commercial buildings, so that's certainly one of the areas we look at. And uh, the uh, most of our inspections are with basement apartments. We, we deal a, a great deal with uh, complaint and request side of basement apartments, so people trying to register them, or perhaps uh, a landlord tenant issue. Yes, so um, we get advice. that call, and, and under our legislation, if we receive that call um, for a complaint, we do have to follow up. So, so a great deal of time is spent with our inspection staff doing uh, basement apartment inspections. What's one of the biggest uh, calls or complaints that you uh, you might get to the fire halls? Probably our, our burning bylaw. Uh, so a neighbor has got a as is burning leaves, which they're not meant to be burning under our new right. bylaw. Uh, the neighbor can't open the window. They can't put out their laundry. 
Uh, so we ended up getting that call. And uh, now with that said, we, we did bring in a new open air burning bylaw. And with that burning bylaw, we've been able to reduce the number of uh, burning complaints we go to by about 13 percent. So we have the, the burn permits now. Maybe explain yes. a little bit about yes. the, the burn so, permits. Uh, prior to 2016, you could go to uh, any, any fire station, uh, come to the Civic Centre, get a burn permit. That burn permit would be good for three days from the time you, you took that burn permit. In 2016, and there was really no control over those burn permits. You could come in and then they'd be issued. Uh, as Inspector or Fire Prevention Officer Wells can, can speak to, uh, there are requirements for that burn permit. That it's not too close to combustibles, that you mm -hmm. have the, the area to safely burn, and you're burning the appropriate material. Uh, so we changed it in 2016, that we, and we charged a fee for it, because it does take staff time mm -hmm. to, to issue those burn permits. When we do have complaints, staff do have to respond and address those complaints. So we, we inter, uh, put in a fee of $35 uh, for the year. Uh, that uh, caused a little bit of a concern within the community. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say that it's, uh, it's been since 2016 we've implemented that. Very few complaints. Uh, if, if anything, uh, uh, the residents seem to appreciate the fact they can come pay a fee, a nominal fee, get a burn permit for the year, right. can explain what the requirements are. They're getting consistent messaging. So it seems to be working out, as the uh, fire prevention officer said, our complaints are, are dropping. That's great. Now, what kind of fires are happening in Georgina? What number of fires, or what, what typically, what are your calls out for, for service other than burning complaints? Uh, again, I'll ask a fire prevention officer to, to speak to this as well, but because he, uh, Mr. Wells does the, ins the investigations for the fires. Ah, okay. But unfortunately, fires are trending upwards. You may hear on the news that fires are trending down. Uh, in Georgina, that's not the case. No. Uh, we would like that to be the case, but it's not. Uh, we can put that down to a couple things. We're a growing community. We're getting more houses. Right. We're getting more population. Uh, buildings don't cause fires; people do. So the number one, one of the number one causes, not only in Georgina, but in Ontario, and uh, nationally as well as in the states, is is cooking fires. And I'll maybe ask uh, fire prevention uh, officers. <clears throat> that. Absolutely. Yeah. As, as the chief had mentioned, our our um, statistics really kind of mirror what the provincial statistics are. So cooking being the number one, a lot of it's unattended cooking. So someone's put something on the, on the stove, they've walked away, maybe they've taken a phone call, maybe something's on TV yeah. that's fantastic I've, to watch. I've done that, where you, know, you put on something and you get busy and then all of a sudden you smell something that's, oh my God. And it does. And it's so quick to, to, to happen. It does. Um, Number, number two fires, really a, a heating, <coughs> heating sources, um, whether it be in the chimneys with the chimney fire mm -hmm. or space heaters, uh, too close to curtains, too close to the couch, that sort of thing. Um, it all contributes to our, to our fire problem. Because I know uh, you've showed us videos in the past about how fast fires happen now. And maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Yes, I, I certainly would, because that's one of my goals is to educate uh, the community. And that's the, the big thing is yes. education. You, what you're trying to do is prevent the fires from happening. Yes. You want to put those fires out when they start, but you want them not uh, to start. And unfortunately, it's, uh, you know, uh, I'll go back 30, 30 years ago uh, when seatbelts first came out. Uh, the OPP and police have, have done tremendous public education efforts trying to... Uh, Educate people on the need, the need to wear a seatbelt. Right. Uh, to this day, uh, that's still a problem. Yeah, there's still people uh, that and, don't. And they've had to resort to enforcement. Uh, you know, we will have to go that way too, as far as fire protection, uh, smoke alarms. But back to the, the, the speed of fire and, and the cooking fires. Uh, Forty percent of the fires are cooking related. Okay. Eighteen percent of the fatalities are caused by cooking fires. Wow. Thirty percent of homeowners admit to leaving as you just did. I just there. did, I just yeah. did. Leaving, leaving the stove to text, to check an email, and it only takes a second. Yeah. That, that pot left on the stove will boil dry, the, the french fries that you're cooking, mm -hmm. and unfortunately a lot of times we see with french fries and, and, and uh, frying fires, there's been alcohol involved. There was none with me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to go on the record. I, I'm, quite, I'm quite sure that's the case. <laughs> But unfortunately, that is the case. You know, you'll get teenagers that come home from a, maybe a night of party. Yep, you have um, a snack they'll, and... They'll put something on the stove and then they'll fall asleep and then a the fire breaks out. So the, the fires, uh, I've been in this business now for, uh, I don't want to say too long, but I, <laughs> I still love this, love this job. And I've been in it now for 36 years. Wow, good for you. Uh, and when I started, the rule of thumb was that, you know, from the time the fire started to flash over, 
which is the, the point when everything in the room will ignite. Be engaged. Everything's off gassing. And I know you've seen some of those those videos and it's those scary. demonstrations. It's scary. It really is terrifying. Uh, you know, the chairs are in the, the council chambers here will be off gassing. Those gases, that's what burns. Right. It's, it's not the hard material. So it used to be 17, 20 minutes to flash over. Gave you time to respond. Gave time for the occupants to get out. Mm -hmm. Your smoke alarm would go off. You still had time to get out. Now it's three minutes, Amazing. if not less. So by the time that smoke alarm goes off in your dwelling, in your apartment, in your home, you only have two minutes or less to get out. Right. So fire is incredibly uh, fast. And I, I kind of liken to the fact that, you know, when you know, we go out and we'll try to light a fire for our kids or grandkids and try to light that fire out in the backyard. You know, and you, you can't get it going. And, and people don't realize the fire in a compartmented space Right in a house, can take off. Takes yeah. off. You got dry material. It's off gassing, and you are well. Uh, and materials are different now than what they used to be yes. years ago as well. The, the materials. I went on a, a course back in 2006 in, in Chicago, and uh, one of the ULC uh, scientists coined the phrase "comfortable gasoline" for oh, upholstered geez. furniture. Because it is petroleum based. Yes. And uh, at that time, I told him I was going to steal that term. I think as every fire chief across uh, North America has now because it's, they're petroleum-based products. So it, fire is incredibly fast. Uh, people wonder, you know, why do we send the resources we do to a fire? That's one of the reasons as well. Yeah, because I know uh, we saw the demonstration of uh, opening windows and doors, uh, having the, the, the airflow move through and, and the flammable materials and how quickly uh, a, a fire can, uh, can spread. So I guess your goal is, is public education. So we do have an, an education officer that goes out uh, into the schools. It is, and, and one of the uh, one of the concerning things we find with our our crews going out to do their smoke alarm program door to door, uh, about thirty percent of our residents uh, that we're able to get into actually don't comply don't with the requirements for Ontario. It's amazing. Um, I'm going to have to cut you off there. We're, we're going to have to go to a, a break, but we're going to come back because there's so much more to, to talk about in terms of fire prevention and how we can uh, educate the public and the other topics that we've we want to get through. So. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, join me when we come back, and we'll continue our conversation with uh, Chief Ron Jenkins and uh, Fire Prevention Officer uh, Keith Wells. So we'll be back soon. Mayor Margaret Kirk and this is Service Georgina. Today we're talking about our fire services here in the town and we have Chief Ron Jenkins and Fire Prevention Officer Keith uh, Wells. Just before we broke we were starting to talk about public education so let's get into that a little bit more. So with public education one, one of the biggest jobs we have is to try and change the mindset of, of our residents. Um, a lot of people think a fire will never happen to me and, right. and that seems to be a, we all a hope large that. misconception. We certainly do hope that uh, one of the statistics uh, that came out from the National Fire Protection Association is that every building over its lifetime will have an average of five fires in it. Oh, wow. And uh, not necessarily talking about those ones where no. our trucks are pulling up and no, the flames are No, but those ones where someone roof. forgets to take a pan off the stove. Absolutely. It could be yeah. someone who, who's put a, a little fire out on their toaster, mm -hmm. uh, a pot on the stove or something like that, and we actually never get called to right. them. Right. Um, but the, all the fires that we go to start with a small fire like that mm -hmm. so it's really important that people realize it can happen to them oh, and, yes. and so that's one of our challenges so when it comes to um, getting out to to the public what are some of the things you do because i know I, we've had the the uh, open houses you i've seen you at uh, other public events but maybe tell us what to what you what to expect if we see you at uh, we went to an open house absolutely uh, we we generally uh, have a booth set up either at the sutton fair we have an, an open house Usually, if there's a community event, you'll either see our trucks or, or the is, fire prevention staff there as I mean, well. Every kid and a lot of adults love to check out uh, the fire trucks, and, 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 and we love to see them too. Right, so. but what do, if they're at the when you're at the Sutton Fair? I know I tried a few things when I was there in terms of uh, extinguishers. Yeah, absolutely, the, this year we've been very fortunate. We uh, we purchased a new fire extinguisher training unit. Uh, it's a propane fire that comes up. Uh, we get to actually go hand-in-hand hand with the public, teach them how to use a fire extinguisher properly, uh, not 
that we want them to use that on every fire in their house. No. But, but if it was a small yeah. fire, they'd be able to contain you, it. You don't want to be scared <clears throat> of that piece of apparatus. You want to be comfortable with it to know what do I do. And I got to tell you, That's that was correct. one of the few times I'd actually used a fire extinguisher. And, and again, we, we want uh, we want people to, to understand the speed of fire. Mm -hmm. So preferably, they'll just they'll leave the dwelling. They'll get out. But if there is a chance that they can, they have an extinguisher at the ready that they can use and they're trained to use that extinguisher. They need to know how to operate it very quickly. Yeah, I know one of the things we did with council earlier this uh, this year was the uh, uh, training day that we all went yes. on, and that was amazing. And maybe tell the viewers what you what you put us through. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, just, just as you stated, everybody likes to, to see the fire truck. I think everybody wants to see what it's like to be a, a firefighter. So uh, in, in cooperation with the association, we put together a fire ops 101 day that yourself and other councillors and, and uh, members of the media attended. And it was a, a scaled down version of what uh, some of the roles and responsibilities and duties we do, <coughs> excuse me, at a fire. At a fire. And just wearing the bunker gear in itself was an experience. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. People don't realize the heat build up with wearing that bunker gear. And yes. the weight. And the weight. Even the boots. The and weight of the <coughs> boots and, and the weight of that, that gear, um, incredible. So it is a, again, as a rule of thumb, uh, so if it's... Uh, you don't have to go Fahrenheit. I'm still one of these Fahrenheit. Oh, yeah, me too. I, I, yeah. So if it's uh, 80 degrees out, you can add another 10 degrees for the sunlight uh, uh, shining on your, your gear, mm -hmm. 10 degrees for the uh, wearing the gear itself, and then another 10 degrees for the exertion. So there's 30 and more degrees. There's 30 more degrees, wow. and then you've got the temperature to deal with with the, uh, fighting the fire itself. Because I know when you're at a fire, you've got <coughs> a, a relief uh, station where the firefighters can come out and remove some of their gear and, and cool down, we get have, their we have rehab vitals and, checked. And, uh, everybody participated in that because they needed to with that event, uh, even yourselves. Yep. Uh, the core cooling chairs, uh, basically they look like a lawn chair yeah. uh, for members of the public when they see firefighters sitting in these, that they're not normal lawn chairs. No. They do have water bladders in each arm. And then the, quick, the quickest in, yeah. way to what one of the things that kills firefighters is heart attacks. Yeah. Uh, outside of traumatic injuries, and one of the stresses on, on the heart is heat, metabolic heat buildup. So firefighters will take their, their bunker gear off, immerse their, their arms, and that will core their inner, inner core. Cool down, yeah. Well, the blood flow, the veins are near the, the top of your, your arm there yeah. in the elbow, and that helps to cool down. And what happens is, you, on average, a firefighter can lose uh, a couple of pints of water through a system just fighting a fire. Wow. What happens is the blood then gets thicker. The, the heart has to the pump harder, harder and the blood pressure increases. So. Amazing, but that was a great day and I it do want to thank you again yes. for, for that. It was uh, quite, a, quite an experience. Yeah, I think everybody enjoyed it. It, it, it was, good. it was, it was great. Um, Keith, tell us a little bit about, uh, we had a recent event that was pretty notable for, uh, for the department. Maybe tell us about that. Absolutely. Uh, National Fire Protection Association, uh, they, they offered a, a scholarship to one of our inspectors um, and it was to go down to Nashville, Tennessee and study the Older Wiser program. And the Older Wiser program doesn't just focus on fire safety, uh, we're just the fire safety piece of that program. Okay. So it's a fire and falls. So we, we make partnerships with different community partners who, who deal with our seniors and uh, we're able to teach about fire safety aspect and they teach about the falls aspect. So that was a special thing that uh, we got funding to send? That's correct, yes. So it, it didn't cost the municipality anything. The NFPA picked up the, the flight great. down, accommodations, everything. So we Good. were very lucky. And that sort of training is, is key because, again, it goes back to that public education, trying to prevent the fires from, from even starting. So as, as the chief mentioned, all of our standards are going to NFPA. So, it's, <coughs> so to be able to go down to NFPA, and directly train with them on some of their programs is, is truly an honor. So. Good. Maybe, Chief, maybe you can touch a bit about uh, the Fire Services Master Plan that we did uh, last year and, and what it called for in terms of uh, additional station and, and resources. Yeah, so uh, we undertook a uh, master fire plan. Typically they're done every 10 years. Uh, we did ours a little bit sooner. I think it was around the seven year, year mark. Uh, but what was unique about this master fire plan is we partnered with uh, East Quillenberry, King, mm -hmm. uh, and Richard Stouffville. So the four municipalities went together. We did four separate individual master fire plans. Uh, however, we did put it out uh, for one consultant, uh, and the, the consultant that makes won, sense, yeah. The consultant won the award. Was able to take a look at four similar departments. Uh, most of them were composite, with the exception of King, which is strictly volunteer, and look at what is working well in one. What's work, working maybe needs a little bit of improvement in another, and be able to look at all those from a, a, a larger, broader scale. Uh, from the master fire plan, there was basically four four components of this fire master plan. 
It was uh, a fire underwriter survey uh, was was done right. to look at the yeah, needs, which that. is which is the insurance industry. Uh, looks at insurance ratings uh, and how the fire service impacts that. Uh, for Georgina specifically, we had a fire station uh, assessment done of our, our facilities, right. which was much needed. The master fire plan itself, and then there was a collaboration and innovation uh, part as well. It ties in the four departments together as to benchmarking, uh, key, key performance indicators, okay. mm -hmm. and then what could come of that. So now that we've got the plan done, what are we doing with it? I know it's not one of these plans that's sitting on the shelf, so. It's sitting on my desk, right, <laughs> right front and center. And uh, between those, those four components, uh, 60 recommendations, either close to 60 recommendations. Wow. Out. And, and that's not a bad thing. No, because there's uh, it's always things you can improve, efficiencies, oops. and things that, in our case, uh, it showed where we need to add additional it, facilities. It, it showed, showed a number of things. It, it spoke to some administrative, uh, you know, more policy right. issues that we need to, need to clean up, just some housekeeping. Uh, it spoke to the fire stations themselves. Uh, our, our stations are, are, are getting older. Mm -hmm. uh, life cycle of a, of a building is usually 50 years. Uh, the Perflaw Fire Station in Station 1A is, is 60, close to 60 years old. Uh, that was determined that that's in need of replacement. Right, which we determined in the, the 2017 budget, 20, and we've been working on the design for that. We're, so we're, we're working towards that. Uh, the Sutton Station, I think, was built in 1972. It's very closely getting to that uh, life cycle as well. And does, did that master plan look at location-wise in terms of where a new station should go? So, for example, did, for Pefferlaw, it, it determined that was you it, know it, along that corridor was. It, it did look at it looked at all locations. It looked at locations of the stations in the surrounding municipalities as well. For us, that's mainly uh, East Gwillimbury, right? Because uh, we have Brock obviously to the to the east. Uh, it looked at locations. Pefferlaw's location is a, is a very good location. Mm -hmm. It's it's right in the in the community. It's part of the community fabric. Oh, it is. Uh, you know, yes, we have railway tracks there, but uh, you know, Perflaw is a, a railway community. Right. So it, that that does uh, it'd be perfect if the train tracks weren't there, but <laughs> the, but they are. They are. Uh, it also looked at the Sutton's location. Sutton's uh, in need of replacement. Sutton again, we've become a, a career department as well. That com right. uh, composite component, and that station's uh, no longer adequate uh, from a space perspective. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and again, the growth has happened, as, as, you know, as we all know, it's good. there's a lot of growth in Keswick. We now have growth along the lake. We exactly. do have some growth along Highway 48. So that station is need uh, to be relocated. Uh, some of the suggested areas was up around Black, uh, Black River and uh, Dalton. Right. In that area, baseline. That's sort of there. Because you want to be able to get <clears throat> out to the community easily and not be tucked away on a, on a side you street. Need, you want to be, yeah, you want quick access to the main artery so you can respond. Uh, so that's, that's something that we'll be looking at in the future, as well as the Keswick station. Yeah, now what about Keswick? Because I know we're looking at uh, putting the uh, fire station down with the, the Merck, the Multi-Use Recreation yes. Centre. So we've had significant growth in, in the Keswick area, in the south, uh, the south end of Keswick. Right. Uh, large po population and dwelling bases down there. So we do need to put a station uh, to the south of Keswick. Uh, the, the current Keswick station has, has served the municipality very well. Uh, again, things have changed. Trucks uh, go back to uh, how things have changed in, in the fire service. Uh, building construction has changed. Fires grow faster, hotter, uh, more intense. Mm -hmm. uh, hence the need for larger trucks uh, carrying more water because we have a large rural area. Exactly. So our, our trucks are getting bigger. So our, we're challenged with the facilities we have. They need to be bigger, uh, be capable of housing larger equipment. So the, the Keswick station probably should move uh, a little bit more northeast on okay. the Woodbine Corridor somewhere to the north. Uh, that way it's quick response to the Sutton area, quick response uh, south to, to Ravenshoe. To Ravenshoe to help in, in those, because as areas. we know, very <clears throat> often we have to rely on the other stations and pulling them in, and then, like you say, do the backfill as well. So and then the large, large response area for where the station is located now is, uh, you know, you kind of, various ways of doing it. Nowadays everything's technology, so it's done by computer-aided dispatch right. and the, the records, you, the data you, you pull. But a large portion of the response area that we cover now is the lake. Yes. And, and uh, you know, while we do have responses on the lake, there's no there's no real dwellings on. No, the lake. no, but so, we so, still have to respond yes. and, and work with. Uh, well, we work with the uh, um, police, YRP yes. for for those responses. Just while we're we're wrapping up here, what do you think the future holds for uh, for the fire department, and the fire services? I think that the the fire services is, is in the future, not just Georgina, but everywhere is, is going to have challenges. Uh, we are seeing a larger growth. We're seeing even in Georgina, we're seeing some vertical growth. Uh, I think there's plans for more apartment buildings. Right, we got intensification. Trace, trace land intensification. Mm -hmm. uh, that's happening everywhere. That creates more resources, needs for more specialized equipment. Uh, it's, uh, but we're doing well. 
I think the residents of Georgina can feel safe. We've got a very, very professional, skilled fire service. Fire service. I know, in, 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 for example, in the new uh, fire hall in Pefferla, the, the training facilities, and I think that's key because, as I said earlier, your volunteers have to be just as well trained as your, your full-timers, and, and that's, that's important. And when you're out there on the truck, you want to make sure that uh, everybody has solid training. Our, our lives depend on each other. Well, they, they certainly do, and, and uh, it's something that uh, we as a, as a community um, feel safe, knowing that we've got a good, solid uh, fire department uh, there to, uh, to support us. And I know uh, it's, it's expensive. It's, it's not cheap. Uh, trucks aren't, uh, they don't give them away, but uh, it's something that we, we need to, uh, to, you know, invest in. So. And yes, you know, there is an expense to a fire service, but uh, we, we know, as you are well aware, uh, Mayor, we've had some serious fires in the past year. And we needed that. So. And, and one of the, uh, the things that the NFPA is looking at is social return on investment. Exactly. And, uh, I'm going to have to cut okay. you off there. I think we're, we're about to, to wrap up. So uh, thank you very much for the conversation. We could probably spend another half hour. Um, I'm Mayor Margaret Quirk, and this has been Service Georgina. Tune in uh, next time when we'll have another department and be answering your questions. Thank you for joining us.